25 years of experience in our field of addictions and a fresh dynamic approach to her work with youth, their families, and with her therapists at the Pine River Institute. We'd actually also like to take a, a moment to uh, thank the Pine River Institute Foundation for help supporting this workshop um, and uh, Christine for helping bring them along. Um, so, sorry. Um, yes, so uh, Dr. Victoria Crichton, she um, is, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> She works at the Pine. Uh, at the, she's at the, works with therapists at the Pine River Institute. She completed her master degree in 1996. Her doctorate in clinical psychology in 2000. Victoria is passionate about helping families to grow and heal, empowering them to find themselves and to communicate and relate more effectively. Christine, who also sits on the Halton Families for Families Family uh, Advisory Committee is um, a co-facilitator of the Active Parenting Workshops with Maria Rosa, and is a graduate student in psychology from the Adler Professional Graduate School in Toronto. She's currently researching the impact of excessive screen time on the lives of children and youth. In the 1990s, Christine worked as a youth counselor and then chose to stay home and raise her four children who are currently 15, 17, 19, and 21 years of age. She has the unique perspective of having seen firsthand the effect screens can have on children when introduced at a different stages of development. So we would very much like to welcome you and we're very happy to have you present on this very interesting topic. Oops. So ladies, if you would like to take it away. Yes, You're very just, excited. Yeah. Sorry about the delay. I just had to push <laughs> no, the button. No to worries. Make it can't be any worse than dropping out my headphones and losing my. <laughs> so, thank you for the introduction, Mona. I am thrilled to be able to offer a workshop um, for Halton Families for Families since I am a member of this community and I truly feel honored to be able to give back in some way. So I'm also honored to be able to work alongside Dr. Creighton, who is actually one of my professors uh, from Adler Graduate Professional School, and she's also my supervisor at Pine River Institute. And we are truly lucky to have Victoria with us tonight, since she comes with an incredible amount of experience working in addictions and a knowledge base that is so helpful in understanding how to help our youth mature and learn to grow into strong young adults. So thank you, Dr. Creighton, for being with me here today. Um, well, thank you, everyone. And I am delighted to be here with Christine because, Christine, you bring the real-life experience of living and growing um, with your children and working with screens. So screen addiction is, has become an international problem that is just beginning to surface in Canada. Over the last few years at Pine River, we have seen a market increase um, in students being admitted into our program with screen addictions. It's rampant. That, and it's a problem that wasn't there five years ago. So it's something that's up and coming. We're seeing adolescents that are so con much more connected to their de devices versus connected to their lives. We also wanna pay attention that we're hearing all these frustrations from parents of not knowing what to do. They recognize that screens are actually, you know, taking over their kid's life, but they don't really know um, how to set the boundaries or the limits around it because they're everywhere. And then when you add the additional stress of COVID, parenting around screens is almost nearly impossible. So tonight, um, Christine and I are, um, are gonna offer you so, some support um, some information about screen addiction and, and actually hopefully give you some guidance about how to, you know, um, parent around this. So. Perfect. So for a few years now, I've been quite uneasy with what I've seen actually um, as a major shift in the way we communicate with uh, amongst ourselves and how we spend most of our time actually in relation to screens. So when I talk to my kids about some of the shifts that I've observed, they like roll their eyes and they say, mom, whatever. 
Um, so they they they're they're not enjoying they're not enjoying the the um, the input from mom. But I know what I've experienced uh, many years ago. And so if we look at the past, I grew up in Toronto, in London, Ontario, in the 1970s. And uh, during that time, nobody had a computer at home. They weren't around yet. Every everyone had maybe one television set. Uh, we had maybe one family landline uh, phone, and these were the 1970s that I remember. And then we fast forward to 2020, where most of us have a home computer or a tablet, and many, in many cases, actually all our members of the family have their own. So the information is at the end of our fingertips with a simple smartphone there's an easy an ease to get information that we need uh, we can reach anybody that we want at any time without even leaving our house so that's how things are accelerated uh, we have the option to multitask all the time if we look at our day as adults we are using screens continuously from the moment we wake up in the morning to the time we go actually to bed at night in the morning, uh, most of us are actually sometimes waking up to an alarm system that's set by us our, our, on our smartphone. Uh, we, um, maybe when we get up, we're looking at notifications, our emails, that's the first thing we do. Our kids, especially our tweens and our teens are doing the same. They may be starting their day uh, with their daily streaks. They're maybe checking what's trending on TikTok or they're watching a YouTube video while they start getting ready for their day. So this is our new reality, and we are continuously surrounded by screens. So is this harmless? So I chose, um, can you hear me or am I on mute? So a recent survey shows that 98% of children have internet access. Reading, right? so you can reach up five devices per household. I think we just happened. I went to pin her, but now I just see her. Sorry, sorry, Maria, Rosa, we can hear you. Yeah. I think your volume's on, just so you know. There we go. Okay. There we go. And there is a growing, growing trend in Canadian schools um, that tablets and smartphones are allowed to be used. Screens are everywhere, and they're pretty incredible. When you hold a phone in your hands, you have access to the sum of all human knowledge. But what is the cost? Um, what is the cost for all this technology? Look around and in this picture, you can see kids are chained to their phones or their videos. They have meltdowns when they're asked to take a break. Is this harmless? So some say screens may even be good for kids, yet there are not one credible study that shows that students are doing better academically because of the screens or that they are becoming better learners. We don't have the research to support that. Instead, there is growing amount of evidence that showing significant, that shows significant negative clinical and neurological effects to the excessive screen use. The creators of all this technology that live in Silicon Valley actually send their kids to Waldorf skill, schools that don't implement screens until their kids reach the eighth grade. Steve Jobs, in an interview, he noted that his kids didn't even have an iPad because he wanted them to use their imaginations. So tonight we will be covering three points. And the first point is that screens are not benign. In fact, they can be very harmful to, their, to our kids. Second, um, we're going to help you know when too much um, screen time is too much. Because often parents go, how do I know when screen use crosses the line? And then lastly, um, we want to educate and empower parents to guide their children around screen use. Um, we recognize that care parents need and they um, can do something about screen use. So when we look at brain imaging research, we can see that screens are stimulating um, the pleasure center of the brain. And that's um, the, what they do is they increase the neurotransmitter that's called dopamine. 
Um, this is the feel good neurotransmitter. So for instance, every time that one of our teens hears or, hear, uh, hears or feels a little ping, a notification on their phone, they anticipate that there will be something interesting that's gonna happen. So they receive a shot of dopamine. It's like a brain orgasm. Some have called this digital candy. It is quite addictive for adults and very addictive for our teens who are still in the process of developing their, their brains. So dopamine is like releasing, um, it's, it's actually something that's released when we have sex. But in this case, the dopamine release is like a dopamine tickle. That's to say it does not get activated for hours on end as it is the case with video gaming. So when teens are playing Minecraft or Call of Duty, they are receiving squirts of this dopamine continuously. It's like a rapid, continuous brain orgasm that creates the addiction. And an adult is better able to put on the brakes using that brain mechanism that controls impulsivity. Um, but that part of the brain, it's called the prefrontal cortex at the front of the brain. It's not fully developed until um, uh, a teenager is about the age of 25. And actually there's some research that shows that for boys, it can actually be later until the end of their 20s. So for a teenager, they will keep playing on and on and on because that dopamine hit, it feels so good to them. The uh, United States Army has used video gaming uh, to get their soldiers ready for being deployed for combat. And playing video games actually is, is a method they use to increase their level of action and ability to decrease their sensitivity towards other people. So as soldiers are deployed, they're ready to be in a combat. They are aggressive and they show little empathy for others, which is what you need to have when you have soldiers that are leaving to go to war, to combat. But these same soldiers, though, are coming back from combat with post-traumatic stress disorder and now using their gaming that they for, for relief, so to help them escape the horrors of the war. So they're playing video games constantly, and since soldiers are not allowed to take any drugs to cope, the digital drug that they use of the video gaming is giving the soldiers the narcotic hit that they need to cope um, without having the worry of testing positive for drugs. Another example of power, the power of gaming can, be, can have on, on the mind is seen at the University of Washington burn unit. Their work has shown that if you give burn victims the option to use a very simple video game um, and to play it while you're re they're receiving their very painful treatment of, um, of, of, for, for their burns, they do actually pretty well. That's to say that burn victims are opting out to play a virtual video game instead of taking actual narcotics to manage their pain. So this is like electronic cocaine. It actually shows us how powerful video games can be on the brain. So, on to the next, sorry, I okay. missed that one. All right, next one. So is it an addiction? Well, at Pine River, I work with kids that are, many of them are addicts. And we're seeing a large increase in obsessive video gaming, compulsive texting, and in so much cell phone use. I surveyed 25 students and all of them indicated that screens, they found screens to be addictive. Many of them tried to cut back. They said that they tried to cut back, but they couldn't. Some noted that when their parents attempted to cut back the screen time or the gaming or even the cell phone use, that they became very angry and actually would th throw a tantrum. Some reported that they used screens over 20 hours per day. Um, some stopped going to school just to play video games. And one student even um, shared that he would use his ADHD medication so he could play better. So um, when parents, I had one parent that he noted that when he took his daughter's cell phone away, she almost went through withdrawal symptoms and had tremors. And so not that they were actual tremors, but she just did not know how to cope with her life when the cell phone was taken away. So it is, the screen is addiction is very real. So um, in the early 
2000, China was the first country to classify internet as an addiction, as a clinical disorder. Today, they have over 400 rehab centers and estimate 10% of their youth are struggling with the addiction. Some are so hooked that they wear adult diapers in order to avoid having to go to the bathroom and interrupt their gameplay. Are we in denial about the severity of this addiction? So uh, when, when teens are actually using screens excessively, they are being pulled away from other activities that are really essential for their development. And one of them is the development of social skills, being able to read social cues, uh, body language, tone of voice, keeping eye contact, reading nonverbal cues correctly. Um, these are all parts of social skill development that cannot be developed in a digital way. So we've all seen our teens in a group, side by side, each on the device, text each other instead of uh, talking to each other. I remember many conversations with parents that are frustrated with their teens. Um, so if you imagine, for instance, helping your teen to prepare for their upcoming sweet 16th birthday celebration and the room is like uh, completely decorated, balloons are up, streamers are up, music's on, and then you decide to go down and check up on the, the 10 girls that are having fun downstairs. And all you notice are um, these 10 girls sitting alongside screens ablaze on Snapchat. And they're texting each other, but they're not actually talking to each other. And this is such a typical image that all of us have seen with our kids now. So learning about how to start a conversation, how to maintain interest, how to allow flow during discussions, to notice the impact of our words on others. These are all important parts of developing social skills. Um, another aspect of excessive screen is increased uh, is the aggression. So in a study at the University of Indiana, there were brain scans that were taken of a group of video gamers. And part of that group was asked to play some violent video games for two weeks, a two week period. And their brain scans then showed an activity in the part of the brain that's responsible for aggression. When the same group of gamers were asked to stop their video gaming for two weeks, their brain scan went back to normal levels. And so we know that the brain changes with aggressive violent video gaming. Other studies have also shown that there's a strong relationship between um, actual aggression and bullying with people uh, that play the violent video games. And th the other part that's really important is to look at actually the very violent first person shooter games, such as Grand Theft Auto. In these games, um, they include repetitive simulation of violent acts, of murder, and just to imagine the developing brain of a teen playing games like this continuously would be pretty, um, pretty gruesome. So some have questioned that of neural connections formed in a teenager's brain when they repetitively are playing these kinds of games. One aspect of excessive screen use is the impact it has. And as we know, teenagers need between eight to 10 hours of sleep per every night. And if even if they can't fall asleep because their circadian rhythm is a little bit different, their bodies actually do st still need that time to regenerate. Um, so screens, um, we've already discussed, are extremely addictive, and one of the reasons teens are not able to sleep is because of that continuous dopamine hit I talked about earlier. Um, as they receive this continuously, they are totally hyper-aroused, um, and this is another reason why it's difficult for them to sort of decompress, uh, and which will allow their brain to be, um, to be relaxed enough to fall asleep. Another reason is that uh, screens themselves, that blue light from the screens affects the sleep, uh, sleep schedule. It actually disrupts uh, the release of melatonin, which is the uh, natural hormone that's released in the brain to notify you that it's time to fall asleep. So just as an example, I remember a middle school boy who had been struggling with school for some time and he had been referred to me to do a um, psychoeducational report and uh, always going to be assessing him for a learning disability. And there were some 
some telltale signs of ADHD. So that's, uh, you know, difficulties with attention, some impulsiveness, and difficulties with regulating his emotions. And the results showed that he had some clear difficulties with reading and writing, for sure. But when I spoke to mom, I realized uh, pretty quickly that the symptoms of ADHD were probably more of a result of excessive, the excessive use of his game of choice, which was Call of Duty. So from the moment he would arrive from home after school, he would lo log on with his friends uh, w uh, from school and they would play actually all evening and most of the nights. So when he arrived at school, he was really irritable during school time. He, was, he had a lot of difficulty with focusing. He had difficulty attending to what the teacher was asking to do. He was uh, very explosive with the other students, with teachers. Um, so as soon as we realized that possibly it was, it was lack of sleep, we, we were able to um, provide that psychoeducation and then able to limit some of the use of the gaming. So at night, he was doing a lot less. He was turning his screens off two hours before going to bed. He had a good eight to 10 hours of sleep every night. And he was a changed boy. I mean, he, be, he became calm at school. He was able to remember uh, what teachers were asking to do. He was able to focus and he was able to learn and to really build on that, those difficulties that he had with reading and writing. Um, another child I do remember in grade eight, um, she had begun using social media for probably about a year and she was doing selfies continuously, doing her streaks every single day, posting regularly on Instagram. Uh, she was really proud of the fact that she had 3,000 followers. She had joined a lot of chat rooms. Um, she had social media accounts that were activated all of her waking hours and even at school she would manage to figure out a way to discreetly add some posts uh, while she was even at school and then all of a sudden she started to have negative um, posts that appeared and many of her posts as uh, she were criticized by others so of course that's where downward spi spirals to, to occur where she started to feel bad about herself and so all of a sudden you had a grade 8 student who's now in that downward spiral there were some thoughts of suicide some self-harm some cutting and then when her parents attempted to remove and even ask her to put that social media aside and take that phone away, then right away they looked in their eyes and there's that, I don't know, I'm sure you've seen it, that sort of complete horror uh, or terror of being, um, of missing out on, on, on connecting with other people on that phone. So that FOMO, that term we often use and hear. So this is, these are examples that illustrate well the link um, between excessive screen use and uh, potentially ADHD, also depression, and also anxiety is also well linked in, in, in many studies. So the last thing that I have on the list is actually physical activity. So exercise, the hours that are spent in front of a screen take away from moments that um, teenagers are moving. And we do know that that's an issue. Uh, we have obesity rates that are increasing in the US and in Canada, and it's quite alarming. It's essential that teenagers have at least one hour of moderate to vig vigorous um, physical activity every day. So that's another element that's important to think of. So the big question is why are children um, exceeding the guidelines? Well, let's just imagine our own lives as parents. Some of us are single parents. Some of us are dual parent families that are both working. We work hard, we're busy, we're overwhelmed. And sometimes we just need to use that virtual babysitter just to get that dinner uh, ready at the end of the day. We also have the added element of uh, COVID right now, keeping our children busy and sort of connect, sort of connected with friends. Um, so the this, this screen here I know is used to entertain, it's used to distract, to um, keep them sort of busy. Um, and I'd never say that we should never use screens this way. Um, a little bit is fine, but the, the problem is when we use it um, excessively. So, um, we are actually using these devices continuously, checking our own social media. Um, even as adults, as parents, we check our emails for work. Um, and in many cases, work is on all the time. So our children, they see this and they feel that this is sort of normal uh, for everybody. So I would question why, I would also question why is it being used? When I have discussions with parents and sometimes parents are feeling that they need to keep their children entertained all 
time. This is when they hear their kids saying, uh, mom, I'm bored. Uh, I don't know what to do. Children are planned out throughout every single day. And I would question why do kids need to be busy doing something all the time? So being bored is okay. It allows for, for someone, for kids to have downtime. It encourages creativity and the imagination of, of the child. So but I have to emphasize that parents are, we're all doing the best we can with the circumstances we have. The, I guess we're just trying to figure out, is there a way that we can find um, a way to keep a better balance of screen so it doesn't impact our kids as much. So the most frequent question that we get from parents is, um, does my child have a screen addiction? And then they follow up, um, what is the appropriate amount of time that their child should use the screen? Should it be two hours? Should it be three hours? And or even even four hours per day? What is the right amount? And the answer is it really doesn't matter. The key to noting if it is addiction or not is how the child responds to having their device taken away. Do they accept the limit or do they rage and have a tech tantrum? Other things to note to see when does screen addiction cross, the screen use cross the line to addiction. Is there a negative impact on their schoolwork, on their family life, or other activities or interests? Are they wanting to just play games and um, not come down to dinner? Are they just using their cell phones during dinner time? Are they hiding their screen usage? Are they sneaking down the middle of the night, say you do put a limit that cell phones need to be, you know, kept away out of the bedroom, and then they sneak around to get their, their cell phones? Are they falling asleep in school from excessive video gaming? Are their emotions up and down and erratic? Um, it's usually as a result of being tired and not knowing how to actually regulate their emotions. Do you find that you have to keep your child always entertained? Do they get easily bored? These are, again, just signs of when it might be crossing a line. Does your child get fidgety or anxious or angry if they do not have their device? Does your child seem always tired? And they often will say, or just wired. So we often, we will have a, you know, we actually um, have a form in which you, we could offer to you guys that you could assess your own child to see when does it cross the line. And it's a questionnaire. So what is the solution? Okay. Um, from what you're hearing from us, you might think that we're anti-tech. We are not at, at all. We recognize how important these amazing devices are. And we realize that we cannot get rid of them. They're important and they'll be with us. We just want to inform you parents about the clinical and the neurological dangers that too much screen times can have on a child's developing brain. And we also want to encourage and support parents um, in helping children develop a healthy relationship with the screens. So it doesn't control and take over their lives, but they can find a balance. We also recognize that breaking free from screen addiction is like dealing with um, an eating disorder. And it's very, you know, eating disorders are very, very complicated, given that we are always faced food in front of us. It's not like, you know, just avoid going to the bar, you know, like an alcohol addiction. Just don't go into bars or a drug addiction. Stay away from that. Food and technology are unavoidable. We need them. We're um, using those uh, substances every day. And so it just makes breaking this addiction very difficult. So the key is a healthy balance. And if needed, and I would say always when there is addiction, address the underlying feelings that may lead to the need for the child to escape from their feelings. And so it's recognizing what's underneath this. So. No connection. Um, there have been a multitude of studies that have shown that uh, there's, there's something really important about human beings uh, needing social connection. 
And so, you know, in psychology, we study rats. <laughs> and when we study, when we've studied rats in the past, um, if you put one rat in an isolated small cage and you provide that rat with an access, access to one bottle of water and a bottle of morphine laced water, the isolated rat will take the drug laced water and will drink it excessively until he dies of an overdose. And so a Canadian, uh, Canadian professor named Dr. Bruce Alexander in the 1970s, he decided to create a rat park. And he decided that if he puts a variety of rats together in a really big, large cage, and he adds some platforms there, and he, and he adds some climbing apparatus, uh, places where the rats can have fun, hide and run around. Um, he also put that famous water bottle, and he also put a morphine-laced bottle. And he found that these rats barely touched the drugged water. So what his conclusion was that, is that addiction is less about the addictive uh, attraction of the drug, but it's more about the conditions of the rat. So when we look at humans, he concluded that we need to look at the lack of interconnections amongst people. Could it be that when we're running uh, around with our busy, busy lives and then we're arriving at home completely exhausted, have we had opportunities for true connection with others, uh, with our kids? And if not, maybe we will attempt to fill that void and use addictive behaviors such as using screen use. So what Rat Park has show, shows us is that addiction is fueled by the lack of connection. And so if we have a good connection with people, really true connection, then we can, you know, use screens in more of a balanced way. So another um, piece of the solution is getting your child out of nature. At Pine Bear, we start all our students um, they begin our residential program up north in the woods, up in Algonquin Park, and they may stay there from six to eight weeks. And they detox from all forms of screens and all forms of substances. When we surveyed our students and asked them if they missed the screens when they were away from them for those that long amount of time, not one student sta stated that they um, sorely missed them. In fact, they said, um, it was initially hard at first, maybe for the first week or two, but they got used to it and they shared that they were grateful for the opportunity. Many noted how calm they felt um, after about two weeks. They noted the peace that came over them um, when they were just out in nature and allowed to just be. They appreciated having the break, especially from social media and having to keep up with their peers what's going on and having to actually present something that they weren't. They did not want it to go back to the way they used to. I, I asked the students, you know, do you want to go back to using screens like you did prior to coming to Pine River? And not one said yes. They appreciated that they had a break and a chance to kind of step away from the screens. When I asked our wilderness leaders, you know, what is it about nature? What is it about our wilderness program that helps um, adolescents get used to um, being without screens? And basically they were saying, not only are the students learning new skills and pushing their boundaries or their comfort zones, which actually help a child feel more alive. He said, um, we're actually building a sense of community, a sense of belonging. Again, going to back what Christine was saying about the connection. Um, and we're creating fun experiences. So getting a child out in nature is a way to help a kid connect with their lives and not with a device. Another thing to add is a research was showed that um, when they looked at kids that were using video games continually, and then they just, after four days of just being in um, nature, they showed actually increases in empathy and decreases in aggression. And they were able to just really um, be actually children more than they were prior. They were able to really just relate to their peers in a more socially effective way. 
So earlier I was talking about the, uh, the game World of Warcraft and, and Minecraft is another one. Um, these are what they're adventure games and uh, very enticing for, for our teens. Um, they allow, what's enticing is that they allow them to sort of live in an imaginary world and sometimes it sort of gives them a little bit of purpose. Um, it's something that we, you know, purpose to be able to sort of develop a, a world and also to protect that world. And it's a natural need that we all have as human beings. So what I propose with uh, this image here, we have um, a sort of a, a real life journey. So another kind of adventure we could propose our kids to do. So this is actually a picture of a retired gymnast and she had suffered many injuries because of her gymnastics. And she uh, just discovered the, lo the love of the adventure of rock climbing. Um, this, this became one of her new passions and it sort of pushed her to go and learn to climb many other large mountains in the world. So I guess one of the things to explore with our teenagers and our children is to really try to help them to try to find um, a new adventure in their lives to move towards. Mm -hmm. Another um, piece of the solution is play. The study showed that kids who play together are more socially competent. They actually have a greater sense of belonging and they have an increased ability to share and cooperate with one another and they demonstrate empathy. One study um, showed that actually, you know, due to being able to play together, their child um, so ADHD went down. Um, they were able to really, you know, show a way of connection to their peers that they, their self-esteem started to um, grow and boost up. And so play is very important. Again, when I surveyed our kids, I had a young girl said that she was jealous of her parents. Um, and she was jealous because she heard how her parents used to ride their bike down the street and ring a person's doorbell. She goes, I never had that chance to do that. I just text a friend. And so they missed out opportunities. Another student said he never built a fort until he was out in nature and actually out to out in our wilderness program, learning how to play and be creative and imaginative. So um, playing together is a way of healing and building connections. So um, I brought this slide just because of it reminded me of um, something that we've learned every single year actually in elementary school, which is the Canada's uh, food guide. So if you remember well, every year in gym class, uh, this is the food, uh, well, it reminds me of the food guide that we uh, had to learn, which, um, which the goal was to find balance in daily eating so that we stayed healthy in our bodies. So here I'm presenting you something a little bit, a different spin, and it's called the Healthy Mind Platter. And it's designed by uh, Dr. Siegel and Dr. Rock. And this guide includes the seven key parts to consider when you're thinking of keeping your, your mind healthy. Um, it's the balance that we all need. It's every single day we should be aiming to touch on these seven key elements to stay healthy mentally. So every day we need adequate sleep. We need to be able to move around, to be physically active, to have times where we focus our attention on something. Uh, we need time in, that's to say we can self-reflect, um, be present, observe what's going on within me or around me, uh, my thoughts, my feelings. Um, downtime is another one, time to, to do nothing, to be, to be bored. Uh, Playtime, we've, we've just talked about that, to laugh, to giggle, um, and then connecting time, which is to be with others, to talk, to share, to have those special moments. So what can parents do? Well, there's a lot that we can do. Uh, the first element is to manage the screen use. And um, this is where we would notice screen use around you and your family. So is the TV on all the time as background noise? Because often in a lot of families that, that is the case. Um, stay involved with your teen's social media feed. 
Make sure that you help your teen be a responsible digital citizen. Teach them how to communicate with others online. Teens want some limits, they really do, but they, but they also uh, need to understand why and they need to be part of the process when we have these, um, these, dis these, uh, these rules that are put on our teens. Um, also discourage teens to do the multitasking. They often, I catch my teens all the time, um, especially at the beginning doing homework and having that phone with them. And once they hear pings, notifications, they're continuously doing homework and then going back and forth. It's just not effective at all. When um, it is time to do homework, smartphones are put away. Um, some people, what they do is they would put it in a family basket in a common area. Um, also, you can deactivate social media feeds on the computer so they're not distracted on the computer as they're working. You can learn about parental controls on certain devices. So, for instance, uh, TikTok, which is still really, really popular, there's uh, parental control on there where you can actually time out so that TikTok turns off at a, after a certain number of minutes that your child has been uh, playing on it. Uh, make sure that you have uh, your passwords to make uh, the passwords for the for your child so that you can make sure that you follow them. You check online to see what they're doing, what they're posting on, what their online profiles are. Mm -hmm. So with um, what else parents can do, when I talk to our students about what they needed from their parents, many said, I needed um, support, but I did not need them to be controlling. Um, a student who was you know, 16 years old, he said his parents were overly controlling about the screens and took, you know, did not let him actually even learn how to manage them on their own. They just said, he was not allowed to have a cell phone. He was not allowed to play any of the video games. And he said he felt very isolated from his peers. And he developed a lot of deep res resentment from them. We, I, but then the other extreme is I had a young girl who said my mom had no clue how much I was on my phone. In fact, it was very common that I would send over a thousand texts a day and she had no idea what activity I was involved in. And she shared, I needed her help because I couldn't manage it myself. And so we are just really, you know, the kids, when they're actually away and free from the addiction of screens, they're saying, help us, but don't over control, you know, but teach us, educate us and support us in managing this. Over to you, Christine. Yeah. Um, one other thing is to make sure that you are able to understand their game. Um, show, show interest in it, maybe play with them. Um, when we look at schools, maybe talk to your schools, childcare. A lot of schools actually have programs that are now that, that stipulate how they want to sort of limit um, uh, the digital access or how much is allowed in the school around the school uh, but after school programs very important to look into and find out what they are allowing um, if they do have some rules or con containment for um, uh, what's going to be permissible um, in the setting um, also modeling healthy screen use is so important so the number one predictor of problematic use in in our kids is actually the parent themselves overusing so we also need to think about what we're showing our kids in by the, the kind of technology we're, we're, we're using. What are um, our media habits? Children model our use and they clearly will tell you how come you're allowed to be on your phone all the time. So, so it's important to model. Um, also, it'd be uh, important to have screen-free time. So moments where um, during a meal, for instance, uh, nobody's allowed to have their screen um, or even some screen-free zones too within the house so that you're able to sort of focus on family meals or um, game nights um, so that you op there's opportunities for you to socialize within your family. I think it's on to you, I believe, Victoria. Okay, so again, it's really just, you know, um, building, keeping that relationship with your team, talking with them, supporting them in managing this. So manage, you know, model and monitor would be the way that we would really sum up 
um, what your role is in helping your kids manage their screen time. So perfect. And then monitoring. Um, so parents need, and we've talked a little bit about this earlier, need to be watchful of the, the signs of excessive screen use. And Victoria's really given us a good idea of what what it looks like when when kids are using too much screens. Um, and I've had many discussions with parents where their kids um, have begun isolating themselves with their screens in their bedrooms or when they're asked to take some time off their screen, they run away from their home or even become violent towards them. So if the child seems to be having difficulty to cope with regular life without the presence of their technology, that's the, the automatic uh, red flag. So I think this is coming to the end actually of our presentation. What was really important is to talk, to educate and to support. And I guess the bottom line, what's the most important is actually keeping like a working relationship, a, a relationship with your, with your teen. That is what is going to make the difference. It's to being able to engage with them and talk to them about screen use. So we are definitely open for any questions. I know we covered a lot of information. Um, we do have resources. We, um, there are a lot of good books. We would highly recommend if people want to um, read Nicholas Cabardis' um, book Glow, called Glow Kids. It's very, very powerful. And it, there's an assessment tool in there to know if your child has screen addiction and it gives really, really good key examples of how you can support your child in breaking away from the addiction and supporting them. So we're open for any questions at this time. I'm just taking a look at the chat for everyone. And <laughs> so far we have uh, a couple of comments that it's been a great presentation, um, extremely informative. Going back to the very beginning, um, the schools have a bring your own device policy. And you did touch on it a little bit around some schools having some policies around that. Um, can you offer any suggestions about this particular area? Um, it's, do you want, do you want me to go? I, I would, Christine. Yes. yes, yes. Um, I think, I think it's really important and, and I'm just going to highlight what we mentioned earlier, the importance of really being, um, communicating with your school to let them know what your thoughts are. Um, I think when we're in high school, it's actually, um, a lot of the, um, um, adolescents are actually encouraged to bring their laptops with them if they have one so that they're able to continue to do the work. I mean, we, we have to understand that adolescents are, the, the amount of work that they're going through, they, they, they're going to have to use a little bit more of their screens. Um, the big question would be that cell phone, which is the one that is the, the more difficult one and challenging one. And some of the schools have been quite proactive in making sure that those phones actually stay in lockers, um, that they don't come into classrooms. Um, very challenging for, um, for parents to try and enforce because it's actually going to be the school that's going to have to decide how to, uh, how to police it. Right. That's a great um, information for everyone to have. I think um, part of the scary part is just the fact that they are in school and so much is sort of out of sight. Um, so definitely that's a tricky one. Um, thank you for your comment. I don't have any other comments or questions at this time. Um, if there's anyone else who would like to um, send me one or if you have anything on your mind, we're still open for that. Um, otherwise, um, we'll give it a few more minutes. If there's anything else, Christine or Victoria, that you'd like to well, add? Maybe one thing I could add, and it's relating a little bit to what we mentioned. I mean, the, the, the most powerful thing that we can do, I think, as, parent, as parents is to be able to, to talk to our kids about situations and to share, you know, what our thoughts are about, you know, in this case, we were talking about bringing their, let's say, their cell phone, their device that's maybe hidden in their pocket. Well, how would you feel if somebody... Uh, videotaped you without you knowing in the classroom. So having those kinds of conversations with them, I think, are good because they're, they're able to sort of reflect on behaviors that they may decide to participate in or, or not. So 
I think that's the key component is to have that open communication uh, with, with our children. Thank you, Christine. That was an, an excellent addition. That's, I guess the ironic part is that there's so many ways of communicating and yet that seems to be the trickiest part these days is maintaining that communication with our, with our kids. Um, I, was, uh, I do have another question here from one of the participants. Is there an age you would recommend that parents try to hold off until buying their child a cell phone? <laughs> That's a great question, <laughs> a great question. And I would say it depends on the child and the maturity of the child. If the child has the ability to, you know, hold to limits or um, ability to actually um, be appropriate with their cell phone use, or is it going to be something that's going to consume them? Before I would give a child a cell phone, I would make sure there's a contract in place around it. And like Christine was saying, is really educating the child of how to use this, like how, how to use a cell phone appropriately, like um, not texting at the dinner table when we're having a discussion. What is that like? So putting in very clear guidelines and talking with your child about, about that, teach them what's appropriate because they don't know and they need your guidance. But again, look at the maturity level of a child. If they're all about consuming and grasping of things outside of them, maybe hold off a little bit until they have a little bit more impulse control. That's a really great way of putting it. There's really no age limit, is there? <laughs> um, the one thing I could maybe add, if that's, if that's okay, is that the, um, you know, sometimes as a first step, if you feel that, that um, your child is, is, is at an age of maturity that would be able to start maybe uh, being exposed to a phone. I mean, getting a, a, um, not a smartphone, but a flip phone, you know, just being able to sort of just be able to call and see how that goes first. And then later on, maybe add in maybe those other functions. Um, another thing that I could maybe mention just by personal experience, I have four children and my eldest is 21. She was exposed to having her first flip phone probably at the age of 14. And if we compare my youngest child who actually had a smartphone probably at the age of 12. And I noticed this that exposure difference in maturity level was very different. My eldest child for sure is one that will value much more that connection, the verbal talking with other people, less so than my um, actually three younger children who have a tendency to be a little bit more active on their social media. Thank you, Christine. I think having real life experience really helps um, kind of teach us that, you know, it depends on the child and depends on actually what's around the technology. It's so much, it's growing so fast and changes so fast. And so, thank you. Very hard to keep up, isn't it, ladies? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a question slash comment. Um, so this is a question on gaming, gaming and violent behaviors. Um, so around mental health, how are they related? Referring to a specific incident that happened in Markham where the person killed his family and posted everything on his gaming site. Um, in your opinion, is this something that there was a connection? If so, how are they related? Okay. There are several studies that really show that gaming um, is, is, very, is so closely connected to um, aggression. And if you actually are in the gaming to the extent of you know, 20 hours a day, if not more, you can almost become psychotic and live in this fantasy world. And so it, it's in extreme cases that this has happened. And you can, there's noted many in the states where similar incidences have happened, and especially I, I believe with the, um, the school shooting in, was it Sandy Hook was also one of this, you know, the same thing that happened where in the way the young boy was in a trance, um, they would say a psychotic trance in, where, with the video game, every person that he killed, he got points. And he got more points when he killed himself. And so 
you know, they cannot differentiate between reality and the game. And so that is why it's so important to limit it and talk and build, like Christine said, build connections. Um, these kids are hungry. If you look at the young boy with Sandy Hook, he was ostracized um, from his peers at, you know, at home and he didn't have a strong connection with his parents. And so um, video games became his life, mm -hmm. so. That's very impactful to see just how much of gaming can bring out these violent behaviors. I know it's been a concern for a lot of people over the years. Um, I don't have any other uh, questions or comments at the moment. So uh, again, as, as we're waiting, if you'd like to bring up another point or an afterthought, um, I'll leave it up to you ladies. Um, in the meantime, I'll just monitor the chat. And if by chance we don't see anything come through, then we will wrap up. Um, but yeah, I'll just give it a few more minutes. So I think I actually forgot to talk about a story about um, Nicholas Carderas actually in my presentation. It had to do with, um, as he describes in this book, there's actually a story in there about a 16 year old boy. I think I forgot to mention it. And he's a 16 year old boy that came to his office at one point um, and he, uh, for some treatment. And he had been on, um, I can't remember if it was uh, Call of Duty um, or maybe it was World of Warcraft, I have a feeling. And he was doing between, you know, 16 hours a day of, of this game. And it's a virtual game. You can go online with, with buddies. Um, and he was not going to school at this point and he walked into the office and Dr. Caderas was asking him lots of questions about what was going on and just probing a little bit and this 16 year old boy was totally lost looking at the ceiling until he said am I still in the game and that's where we realized that or he realized Dr. Caderas that this this little student 16 year old was totally lost he was still in the game he couldn't figure out if he was in the game or out of the game so that's what we call about that that's what's called psych uh, it's a, like a gaming psychosis where you're sort of stuck in the game you just don't know are you in the game or out of the game so it just shows you the impact of doing that kind of gaming level it just um, plays havoc in your brain and your your perception of reality. And Christine, I would say, you know, what is key if we're not saying this enough, but the adolescent brain is still developing and it's not fully formed. And so these, the gaming really impacts the way it's being developed. And so it's not benign and parents really, really need to kind of limit or support the child in getting healthy ways so healthy brain connections are formed. So. And one of the fears, I think sometimes we scare people thinking that they can't, you know, it's too late, it's not too late. You can still make new connections, um, experience new things and those connections can sort of, sort of rejig within the brain so um, it's just a matter of, of, of new exp of having new exposures it's never too late <laughs> yeah just a quick comment to build upon what you were just saying Christine so gaming today happens that you know you're part of a, um, a group of people you, you'd almost say that this was the new way of socializing or going to play outside if you will um, because let's face it, they just, they're not outside anymore, our kids, right? They're, they're gaming with each other and you can hear them speaking. So in this capacity, how would a parent um, or caregiver, um, what was the best advice you could give in terms of how do you control the gaming when the gaming is also the socialization piece, especially during this time where um, kids have been at home more so than ever. So no extracurriculars, no soccer, no hockey, no, um, you know, tennis, et cetera. Um, which was a, a good way for them to socialize. Um, anything you can um, help in that regard? Yeah, I think I think COVID has sort of it's it's a curveball. It's just it's made it hard for everybody. But I think at the, the back of our minds, I think we have to be really creative in trying to figure ways of having some kind of balance and even if it just means doing stuff within the family, going out for going outside and doing an activity um, 
we've got to figure out a way of doing it because um, um, cause it can be long-term very damaging. So I don't know if that helps in any way. I know it's a struggle. <laughs> <laughs> That's helpful. I think um, just to hear it from a parent's point of view um, is, is important to know that there's options and that this time is making everything a little harder to do. Um, <laughs> Well, one thing I, ha I can say is that since COVID has been around, I have noticed so many more people connecting outside with their families on our biking trails. They are going to the provincial parks. Um, I mean, those are the things that, that are really going to be healthy, I think, for our, little, our, our minds and our kids' minds. So I think let's continue in that venue is what we're proposing. Good thought. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any other questions or comments. So, um, and given the time is about 10 after eight, um, I guess we'll, uh, first of all, thank you guys very much. I'm going to give this back over to Mona. Um, and from my own standpoint, I, I thank you both very much as a parent of older kids. Um, there is never such a thing as too much information <laughs> or, or we've heard this all before. So thank you for a fresh perspective on something that is becoming um, almost to the point where it's critical, right? So thank you very much. Absolutely. And thank you. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, a big thank you, Dr. Victoria Crichton and Christine for a wonderful workshop this evening. It was actually such a wealth of information, again, for somebody who has kids um, and in so much packed in there in such a short amount of time. Um, a big thank you to uh, Pine River Institute Foundation again for helping support this workshop and for all the work that they do with adolescents that live with uh, addictive behaviors and other mental health challenges in the community. A few more things. Uh, we will be posting the presentation and the recorded workshop as a resource on the website, so the Halton Families for Families. And um, your opinion is very important to us as we try to to provide you with the best uh, workshop experience. So if we could ask you to please take a few moments to complete the survey before you leave us, that would be very much appreciated. And last but not least, uh, if you can please stay tuned, we will present more informative workshops in September and that'll be posted somewhere, somehow, soon. <laughs> Thank you very much again, everybody, for joining us. And this was fantastic. Thank you so much, Mona. You did a great job. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, we will log off. So if, um, if you'd like to leave us, you can. I will be sending an email with the survey link as well if you didn't get a chance through the chat. Um, and we will be sharing um, that information with our presenters, too. So really important to get your feedback on how this helped you and perhaps what you'd like to see more of as we plan our workshops for you guys. So thank you again, everyone. Have a great night.